And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Mindy Totfest, who worked as an ICU nurse prior to a 2016 brain aneurysm, which resulted in a near-death experience that transformed her life. Besides her NDE, she's also the director of training of MUFON and has been a guest on Ancient Aliens Season 19. Mindy, thank you for joining me and welcome. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. I'm a pleasure to be here and I'm glad to finally connect with you. Well, we are excited to have you. And if you don't mind, let's start with your aneurysm and go from there. Sure. Um, it was during um, November of 2016, uh, whenever my encounter happened. We were living out on a small farm in northern Oklahoma, uh, had moved back out there to help my father-in-law, who was having some health problems, and my husband, you know, being a big, strong farm boy, um, decided to get back out there and to help his father. Uh, so we were living in a small trailer house just out in the middle of nowhere, northern Oklahoma. Uh, it was about 300 acres of wheat farm surrounding us. And the only real neighbor was our father-in-law that lived across the street. Um, so I was in a very secluded area. And that morning, it was actually the um, election day between Trump and Hillary. And so we were excited to get up and take our kids out and show them how to vote and everything. At the time, they were elementary age. Um, and so it was really kind of the first time that we were introducing him to introducing them to the um you know voting process. And so my husband, he worked at the school at the time. He was a Southern Baptist minister, and we had traveled all over the state, um, you know, preaching the gospel and had kind of taken a step back from that for the time being. He kind of filled in at churches from time to time, but for the most part, he was working at the local school. And so he drove the school bus with the kids in the morning. And so I saw him off that morning. Um, and I noticed that my face was a little bit swollen there on the side. And so I took a picture and sent it to my husband and said, hey, you know, something is kind of off here. I'm not hurting, but something isn't quite right. Um, but I'll keep an eye on it. And so he said, why don't you try taking a Benadryl and, you know, jump in the shower, see if that helps anything. Uh, at the time, we thought maybe I was having an allergic reaction to something unknown. Um, so I, I jump in the shower, I get out. By this time, it's, you know, early afternoon. And I sit down on the couch to check for any early exit polls. And whenever I did, that's when I heard this loud gunshot sound go off in my head. And at first, I, I thought maybe I had been shot. There had been coyote hunters out around the area in the days prior. And I thought, oh, my gosh, they've shot through this wall of this flimsy little trailer house. And they've shot me in the head. And uh, because that that's equivalent to the explosion I heard. Um, so being a nurse, I'm trying to assess what's going on. I'm, I'm trying to focus my attention to the back of my head to see if I can feel any blood coming down, you know, trying to locate where this may, might have happened specifically. And I couldn't, um, I didn't feel anything running down. So I thought, okay, this is something internal. Um, and I knew this has got to be some kind of brain aneurysm. Um, I knew that I had a genetic condition called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and it makes you prone to aneurysms. Everyone on my father's side has died of aneurysms. And so I knew instantly this is more than likely what, what's happening. Um, and as I'm, I'm realizing this, I feel this electrical avalanche is the best I can describe it, that came rolling from the top of my head down, almost like a peeling away that was rolling down my body, down to my toes. And at that, I, I knew I'm not going to survive this. Um, I'm looking at the front door, it's wide open. I'm expecting my husband and kids to run in anytime. And it just instantly turned to heartbreak because I'm waiting for them to run in and give me hugs and kisses and tell me about their day. And, and I knew none of that was gonna happen. I knew that someone I love 
uh, was going to come in and find my body. And it was, you can tell it's been eight years and I'm still, you know, that, that was heart wrenching um, to think that you're going to become one of the worst things that's ever happened to the people you love most. And so instantly I just went deep into prayer. I turned to my, my religious upbringing and said, you know, Jesus, please, if I can survive this, please, without, you know, being any kind of burden on the family, please let me survive this. Um, you know, and praying for my kids, hopefully they, they don't come in. You know, I was hoping it would be my husband that would come in first. Um, so I sat in my prayers and deep, deep prayer. And I felt my head kind of bobbing and, um, you know, dropping down. And the next thing I know, I'm, I stop praying and I look around and I'm just in complete darkness. I'm not in any pain. And I'm trying to figure out where am I? Um, I start looking around, trying to figure out, is it dark or is there nothing here? So my first instinct was to put my hand out in front of my face and see if I could see it. Um, and that's what you see on the front of the book is that hand in the darkness. Um, and so when I couldn't see my hand, my next instinct was, do I have hands? So I started to clap, you know, um, and I couldn't. And that's when the realization was, I've crossed over. I didn't even know when it happened because I I didn't have like you hear some people lifting out of their body and seeing, you know, their body. I didn't have any of that. Mine, I think I was just in such deep remorse and, and sorrow that I, I didn't even notice it, you know, before I knew it, I was there. So as I'm sitting there realizing that I don't have any form, I'm turning to my Christian thinking, you know, what's next? Um, I'm expecting loved ones to show up. I'm expecting Jesus to come greet me, looking even for a tunnel of light. Um, I was very expectant. I was very hopeful, you know, okay, I've made it over. I've passed that dying process and I'm here. Um, so I was looking for a joyful reunion. Um, and the longer I waited, the more nervous I became because nothing was coming. And so I start praying over there. I'm praying, Jesus, be my righteousness. Obviously, I can't make it in without you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm expecting to go to heaven and everything, and, and this isn't happening. So whatever I've done, Jesus, please forgive me. You know, stand in my place and, and let me come to heaven with you. And still nothing. So I start kind of looking around. I can feel one thing I've heard about the void. Um, I called it the dark abyss when I came back. I didn't know the word for it. Um, it wasn't part of my teaching prior to this. So I had no idea where I was. Um, and when I first arrived there, I wasn't distressed. The distress came with the, the passing of time. Um, which is kind of hard to explain. It wasn't like there was a sequence of events, but there was a sense of timelessness. So it seemed like an eternity. That's where the stress started sinking in because I started realizing I'm here by myself. And I could feel God all around me. Um, one thing that people say is that the void is void of God. It was not for me. Um, God surrounded me everywhere um and it was an immense force it wasn't a man in the sky you know um i couldn't attribute male or female to it or anything it was just this immense force of power much bigger than i could have ever imagined but i was separate from it i was almost in a invisible box that was holding me separate from being part of everything in the world, everything in creation, the source of creation. And that was really the height of soul crushing because I did not understand why I wasn't allowed to be part of everything um, that ever existed. So I started 
turning inwards. I didn't have like a life review. Uh, mine was more of a self-reflection where I turned inwards and said, okay, what's so wrong with me that I'm literally separate from everything else in creation? Why am I not allowed to be part of it? Um, and I didn't know if I was the only one that, you know, this was assigned to. I didn't know other people, you know, if they had been separated from everything before. Um, so I, I started searching and it wasn't the fact that I had been separate from loving people. That had never been my problem. My problem was with loving myself. And as soon as I had that realization, there was a presence that came up behind me over my left shoulder. And I describe in the book, it didn't feel necessarily human. It wasn't an angel. It wasn't ET. I, I can't tell you what it was. It was definitely a male presence. And it was almost cold towards me. Um, it was a, a sterile compassion is the best words I can use. Um, almost like he saw my distress and wanted to relieve it, but wanted to remain separate from it, was not supposed to be intervening, um, but he did anyway. Um, and as soon as I had said, okay, I need to learn to love myself, he said, you are not going to be here forever. And it was instant to my mind um, that he told me that. And as soon as he did, there was relief because I knew that I wasn't there by myself. And if I trusted this, this entity, this presence, then I'm not going to be here forever. Um, which those were my two biggest fears. Uh, so it was instant relief for me upon hearing that. So once he tells me this, we sail off it to the left. It's almost like he started moving and I moved with him. Um, and off in the distance, I could see this purple glow. And as we got closer and closer to it, I could see these pink intersecting lines in it. And where they came together, it glowed bright yellow and just gave off this warmth. And we kept going closer and closer to it. Now, since, since this time, I've seen um, pictures of the cosmic web. This is exactly what I saw. I, I described it in the book as a map of brain neurons. Um, they look very, very similar. And this is what it looked like. But as we got closer, it was just immense love coming off of it. And I thought, what is that? And he instantly told me, that's the fabric of humanity. And I wanted to go towards it. I, I wanted to be part of it. It was almost like all the goodness of souls, past and present and future, resided there. And it was so important to where I was. I mean, it, it hung with the most importance of everything. And he told me, that's not for you. And so once we did, um, you know, he got, let me get close enough to get a good look at it, to reveal it to me. And then we sailed off further to the left. And then, boom, I was instantly back in my body. Um, when I came to, it was with a hard restart. It was almost like a computer booting up, like, whoop, you know, um, that I came back and I started hearing kind of the muffled sounds on the TV. Um and I was slumped over on the couch. I had had a stroke, so I had lost um, any movement in my right arm. So I kept trying to prop up and sit up, but I kept falling over. Um, and I was trying to find my phone. And I was finally able to locate it and call my father-in-law across the street. And I just kind of slurred out 911 because my speech was just all garbled. Um, but he was there within minutes, I mean, within minutes he was standing in my front room and I thought okay I've I've survived this and um, now it's time to get some medical help. Mindy thank you for sharing your experience with us. I find it fascinating that the problem of loving yourself was some big block on the other side. Can you tell us a little bit more about the history of not loving yourself or why do you think that was such a problem? Yeah um well, I think that there's many layers to it. Um, 
I always had this grandiose idea of other people and, and putting them up on a pedestal, you know, their opinions were more important than mine. Uh, a, lot, a lot of that sink in during high school with bullying and, you know, people cutting me down. Uh, you know, I had crooked teeth and, you know, people would make fun of me. And I was always kind of the weird kid, you know, and that, that sticks with you. Um, even even if you want to move past it as an adult, you still hear those those voices. Um, and And I know that's something a lot of people could probably relate to. But I let it hold me down for so many years and combining that with my religious teachings. I had grown up Pentecostal. And so I I believe that I was the worst of the worst. There was nothing, you know, um, I could do to get into heaven. There was nothing good about me that I had to have forgiveness for whatever I may have thought wrong or, you know, um. And so I, I constantly put myself down and and um, found ways not to love myself. Uh, and well, I don't think that that necessarily kept me from going to heaven. Um, I think, you know, I know some people think that, um, or their their experience on the other side is that they create their own environment. For me, it didn't feel like that. Um, for me, it felt like this was very much a predetermined, predestined meeting that I had to go over there. I had to encounter specifically the void and find that realization within myself um, to come back and do whatever I'm supposed to be doing on this planet. Um, so for me, while I was terrified at the time um, because of the isolation I believe where I was sent was the exact place that my spirit needed. If I would have gone over to heaven, I never would have been on this journey that I'm on now. Um, I would have been, I would have come back and been like, yeah, I went to heaven. It was wonderful, you know, and it was everything I've ever been taught and hoped for and even more. And uh, for whatever reason, I was not supposed to come back with that. I was supposed to come back and question deeply. Um, even the existence of the void, um, a place I was not even aware of until I went there. Um, and so I had no preconceived notions of what I was supposed to encounter there. Um, I know some people and some religious teachings think of it as nirvana. If I would have come from a Buddhist background, I would have I would have been ecstatic. I would have thought, hey, I, I've reached the highest heaven, um, which I've kind of come to believe now. I believe I was kind of outside of the matrix and was able to get a view of the controls behind the scenes um, is exactly where I was. Um, so I was outside of any kind of simulated environment, whether it be here on earth or in heaven or in hell or any other kind of environment people may find themselves in the other side. I think I was you know, literally behind the curtain. Are you saying that you think that you planned this out pre-birth? Well, I don't know if I planned it out, but I believe that it was predestined. Um, whether I had a, a doing in that, I don't know. But I think that it was definitely a wake-up call. It was a um, an intervention, really, to get me back on track and to things that I knew to be true within myself, within spirituality and within... Uh, my connection to God, the source, and to, you know, operations here with, the, with the, you know, on the earth. Um, I needed to course correct, and it was a dramatic way of course correcting that. So since you're saying that you needed to be course corrected, what do you think your purpose is here? Well, I, I tend to... Um, Think along the same lines as what Dr. Kenneth Ring would say. Um, I believe that some of us are are predestined to have these kind of shamanistic journeys. Uh, we all bring back parts of information uh, from being on that other side that are helpful to all of humanity. Um, so I think that, you know, just being over there, I was supposed to bring back that information of, of the void and 
its operations through what I experienced um, and through putting that together with others who've been to the void, others who have gone over to heaven or a more hellish encounter, um, we can start putting together some of these um, important bits of information that can reveal a lot to us about, you know, why we're even here and what we can expect to return to uh, whenever we do end up taking that journey for the final time. Do you think everybody's here for a shamanic journey or only you know, a limited few? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that we all have little things that we encounter. Um, and of course, the person has to be open to it. So even crossing into the, the UFO sphere, these are, again, types of shamanic journeys where they are encountering different types of beings different types of environments, um, and all of these little complexities that each of these experiences bring back piece together and can give us a much better idea of the puzzle of existence. I mean, that, that's a huge thing, but, um, you know, I think one of the main things that you hear time and time again is that we, we're all connected. We all need to learn to love each other. Um, you know, and, and that goes back to all of the world's religions. It tells you, you know, treat others how you want to be treated. Love each other because there is a connection. There is a, a connecting energy that goes between all of us. Um, and what we do to others really affects ourselves. Uh, and, you know, that's part of, um, you hear of the life reviews of some of the others uh, that have gone through the actual life review process in a little more detail than what I did. And they actually experience things from the other person's perspective. They see how they made them feel. Um, and so all of this, you know, comes back here to us on earth in our human existence. And we're trying to understand, you know, the operations behind it all. It's very simple, love each other, you're connected. Um, we're all in it together. and you know, we've got to knock off the wars and the, the hatred and un unneeded um, because we're all struggling and we're all here to learn. So I think that everybody has some sort of insight that they bring to the table, but especially with these extraordinary kind of encounters like the near-death experiences and UFO encounters. Um, we've had a, a peek into something on another level, um, for whatever reason, uh, we've been allowed to see that um, and bring it back to those that'll that'll hear about it. Now, you mentioned about being in the void is being outside of the matrix. And I've spoke with another guest about the same thing. Do you think that we should try to go to the void? Because if we do, stay within the matrix that will just get recycled back in and reincarnate over and over again? Well, and see, now you're touching on reincarnation, and that's not something that I've really, you know, have in my mind one way or another. Um, I've heard good arguments for and against. Um, but I know that within the, um, within the void, there was a study in 1983 that was carried out by the U.S. government and Army Intel, and it was called Analysis and Assessment of Gateway Process. And in this, they were trying to find ways to collect information from other dimensions, uh, with the highest dimension being the absolute. And what they described the absolute is, is exactly what I encountered in the void. They said it's outside of time, it's outside of construct, there is no time, there is no, no physical existence there. Um, and that's, that's exactly where I was. So they were trying to send psychic spies over to this area to um, make contact with entities over there in order to gather intelligence and bring it back here um, for developments within... Um, within our government and within our military complex. So um, I think the government's aware of the existence of the void and the importance of it. Um, 
whenever I first came back and reinserted back in my body, like I said, it was almost like a computer rebooting. And it took me a couple of years to fully integrate my mind and my consciousness back into this reality. I, it was almost as if I could see ones and zeros everywhere. Nothing felt real. And there's a, a, a phenomena known as derealization that can happen with PTSD, which I know I had. Um, I did have to go through a year of counseling for the PTSD um, related to just the physical side of things that I encountered, um, not even on the near-death side. But um, I you know, considered it as this derealization. And I had to come to the conclusion that it's not because I had a longing and a memory of a place that was very real. It was realer than this, this reality. Um, so it wasn't like I was wanting to create something and go somewhere else to escape this reality. I knew the void was real. Um, and I knew my pure existence over there. Uh, one of the things I go into in the book is um, how I was almost stripped of my humanness. I maintained my individuality, but I I was only my thoughts. I was only my consciousness. So it was amplified. Um, and it was a whole different state of being than what we are here. It's almost like we're dulled here, you know, um, we're limited on that connection. Uh, but over there, that it, it was experienced, you know, a thousand fold every, every um, feeling that I had and every emotion was just unboxed uh, beyond anything I've ever felt here on earth. All right. You come back, you have to process all this. When did you get into UFOs? <laughs> well, um, I ended up, it took about two years for me to get a firm diagnosis. By the time they, um, my husband got home, my kids got home after the, the aneurysm, which we found out was a vertebral artery dissection. So it's kind of a, a stroke and an aneurysm together. Um, it ripped two big um, tears into my vertebral artery back on my neck, going into my brain. Um, by the time they got home, they got me loaded up. We drove about 30 miles to the closest little county hospital, uh, which was so ill-equipped to handle any kind of trauma on that level um, or to diagnose. Um, so they did one scan and sent me home and told me I'd, I had had a migraine um, or that my neck had maybe shifted. Yeah, um, unbelievable. Uh, I had lost 90% of my hearing. So I had gone deaf. Um, over the course of a couple hours, my um, arm and stuff started to regain function and my speech started to clear. So they went ahead and sent me home. And it took two years. I kept going back to the neurologist and saying something is not right. I'm still losing consciousness. I am passing out. Um, my head was on fire. Um, they call it the suicide disease because it was it fried every nerve in my head and so it felt like lava constantly going through my skull um, and this went on for two years before we finally had enough and I told my husband look I'm gonna die if they don't figure out what this is and you know if this happens again it will kill me so we sold our home on the farm and we moved out to Oklahoma City and it was kind of a divine intervention thing where I kept seeing commercials for um, Integris Hospital down the street and they had like heroes of the hospital, you know, and uh, had a doctor on there who had a young nurse, which I was an ICU nurse. Um, she was blonde in her thirties, which that was just like me. Um, she had stepped into the shower and had leaned back to rinse uh, shampoo out of her hair and heard a loud pop before she fell to the ground, lost control of her arm and her speech was slurred. And I said, oh my God, this is it. You know, for this commercial to keep coming up, I looked it up and she had had a vertebral artery dissection. So I got a hold of the doctor here, um, the same doctor, and she was like, well, this is extremely rare, but we'll we'll see. Um, so she sent me in within two weeks. I 
you know, had got, undergone the correct kind of uh, procedure for them to be able to identify it. And they said, absolutely, this is what's happened. Um, and it's amazing that you survived it. Um, so, uh, so I finally got help. Uh, I ended up back in the hospital again. I had another slight tear. Uh, was in the neuro step down unit for a couple of days. Blood pressure was 40 over 20. And by this time, my kids are, you know, uh, preteen kind of age. And I told my husband, you know, I, I don't know if I'm going to survive this. It, you know, things, things are getting pretty grim here. Um, if this happens again, we need to start making the hard decisions. You know, mom has a burial plot over here in the cemetery. She said we could use it for me if we need it. Um, I want this woman to step in and be a strong influence in my kids' lives. Um, you know, and just making all the, the funeral arrangements. These are the songs I want played. And it's horrible. It's nothing you want to talk about when you're in your late 30s. But we we had to face that conversation. And part of that was my husband saying, okay, well, with the time you have here, what what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to go to Roswell. <laughs> and so um, I had always been interested in UFOs. I was the kid that, oh, I was such a nerd. I would ride my bicycle down to the bookmobile and check, check out all of the books on, on UFOs. And uh, I would watch every episode of Sightings and Unsolved Mysteries when it would come up with UFOs, the unexplained, you know, that that was me. Um, even though I didn't have UFO encounters, um, I had always been so, so, so interested in the subject. Um, so he went ahead and, and scheduled up and planned out the trip. We went to Roswell, took the kids, had a great time. Uh, I still was not doing very well, nearly passing out. <laughs> I mean, I'm, it was a dream come true to be there for the festival, but I was also struggling. And, and so we went and we listened to the speakers. One of the tables I went up to afterwards was Kathleen Martin, who is the niece of Betty and Barney Hill, who had the huge abduction case up in the Northeast back in the 60s. And she had started the Experiencer Resource Team for MUFON, which is the Mutual UFO Network. And so she was working directly with experiencers. And I spoke to her some about um, maybe doing some kind of regression or something so that I could help integrate my near-death experience, you know, and, and move past it because I was still struggling very much with my, where I stood religiously. Um, since what I had encountered was contrary to everything that I was expecting, um, you know, and and that's one thing just to kind of go off on a, a trail here. People have said, you know, maybe I didn't have strong enough faith or I wasn't a very good Christian. I had nothing but faith. That that was all I was hanging on to on the other side was my faith. I was very expectant of going to heaven. And so whenever that didn't happen, it was a complete ontological shock to my system. What what do I, what does this mean now for me? Um, in light of what I've always believed. So I had spoke with Kathleen about maybe doing the um, quantum hypnosis technique to try to integrate that um, and try to to move past, you know, and and figure out where I stood now. And um, so on the way home, I, I told my husband, I said, it'd be fun. Let's let's see if they have MUFON meetings in Oklahoma and let's maybe go to some that would, you know, kind of keep me entertained during this whole healing process. And so I called headquarters and they said, we don't have anyone in Oklahoma right now, uh, but we need people. And so I spoke with the director of investigations, Doug Wilson, for two and a half hours. This man sat on the phone with me, and he's like one of the highest people in the organization. <laughs> and here he is talking to little old me in Oklahoma, and I was just tickled. Um, but he said, let's get you trained up. If you want to be an investigator, you know, it's all volunteer, but we'll train you how to do it. And so I said, OK, let's do it. So that was a perfect thing for me because most of it was done online or over the phone. Um, you know, you had to work your way up to getting the category three 
kind of cases where it's abductions and landings and stuff. So starting off, it was perfect for me. I was able to sit on my laptop at home. Um, you know, if I didn't feel well, I could lay down and get up and work more on my cases. And I I loved it. It was absolutely a dream come true. So um, within a year, I was promoted to state director here in Oklahoma and then um, started working on a training platform after Doug Wilson had stepped down as director of in investigations. Um, there was kind of a hole that needed to be filled with training. And so I worked with a great friend within MUFON, uh, Terry Lynn Keel and her husband. And um, we developed a whole training curriculum for um, how to investigate UFO encounters. And so now we've launched MUFON University where our investigators can go on and they take a whole university course um, on how to identify things that are identifiable and how to investigate the things that are not. So that's, again, just, it, it is the epitome of everything that I ever wanted to do in life, but never knew how to get started. I mean, how do you, how do you become an expert in UFOs? You know, <laughs> so um, ever since coming back, it's like everything has been laid out for me. Um, everything that I always felt in my spirit of where I needed to be going in life was almost just laid out in a beautiful road for me, you know, as long as I took that next step, everything just kind of fell in place and has happened. Um, eventually, like you had said, finally leading me up to being on Ancient Aliens, which just blew my mind. I mean, how does someone who was dying a few years ago now get to be on the biggest show on History Channel? And it wasn't like anyone even knew me. I was the unknown. Um, so I very much believe that there is a, a guiding force behind us um, when we're returned and whenever we try to fulfill uh, those missions that we're sent back with. Um, even if we don't know, if, as long as we step out in faith, um, it, the road un unravels and, you know, just it, it just goes before you. Well, it seems that all the pieces fall into place for you and UFOs. So mm -hmm. do you think being involved with UFOs is your purpose? I do. Um, one of the first things I did when I first started working with experiencers, um, I became part of the experiencer resource team that Kathleen Martin had started. And in speaking with abductees, that's whenever it really kind of started clicking for me. Um, I would listen to them and I thought, okay, these people sound a heck of a lot like me. Why? You know, I, I tried to at first keep things separate. You know, I thought the UFO thing was a distraction from having to deal with my near-death experience. <laughs> and that, of course, did not turn out to be the case. Instead, I started finding these commonalities and going, oh, my God, there's got to be something here. There's some connection. Um, and if there is some, someone smarter than me has obviously seen this before, too. And so I started looking it up. And I came across Dr. Kenneth Ring, who wrote the Omega Project back in the early 90s. Um, and for those that who may not know him, he is one of the four founding members of IONS, which is the International Association for Near-Death Studies. Uh, it was him and Raymond Moody and um, Dr. Bruce Grayson and M Michael Sabom. Uh, all together, these doctors got together to form IONS to, to help people that have had near-death experiences um, and to learn from them. And so finding Dr. Ring's work with the Omega Project was, I mean, I ordered that book up so fast <laughs> because here was this doctor who's an ex expert in near-death experiences who is saying there's absolutely some kind of underlying um, connection between these people and UFO experiencers. Um, and how he started in this was he was doing, um, he was working at the University of Connecticut and he was doing research into near-death experiences. And a friend of his, a colleague had given him a book by Whitley Strieber, which was communion. And it was funny at the same time um, that I'm discovering this, I was reading communion by Whitley Strieber and it was really one of the things that pushed me towards, okay, other people are seeing this. Um, 
you know, Whitley, some of his his wording in that book, when he talks about, you know, our world being of a shadow and being encompassed and, you know, um, you know, enwrapped in, in by this phenomena, uh, his words sounded so very close to my own coming from a near-death perspective. Um, so that's what kind of pushed Ken Ring into looking into these connections. He said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll humor you. I see that there could be some kind of connection, he told his, his colleague. And so he set up a whole study, uh, which was the Omega Project, where he looked at the backgrounds and the after effects of near death and UFO experiencers. And what he came to was two major conclusions. The first one was that there is an encounter prone personality. Uh, one of his longtime questions was, why do some people have near death experiences and some don't? Why do some people return? You know, they've they've gone through a death and dying experience, but when they return, they have no no memory of of the afterlife. Uh, they just return. So what what differentiates these people? Um, and what he found was that there was that encounter prone personality. And a lot of them have some kind of trauma in their background um, that has taught them how to um, project their mind into other realms. And he was able to differentiate between them and people that were fantasy prone. So these aren't fantasy prone people. These are people who have actually trained their mind to dissociate to the exclusion of their environment. And it wasn't always just people that have had trauma. Um, sometimes it is just natural inborn ability that people were born with that they were they had that connection with the other side or with other realms. Um, and some was fostered by parents or teachers that um, taught them this ability. So there's there's several different things that they he found in the backgrounds of people that could cause them to have this encounter prone personality that would um, kind of lead them into having these more paranormal encounters or having memories of near-death experiences or um, having memories of abduction encounters. Um, the other part of that was the set of after effects that he found in both so sides of the experiencers. And that's what I was finding when I was talking to people um, on the UFO side of things through the experiencer resource team. Um, we come back after these kind of in, encounters and you're more altruistic. You're, you're more in touch with being kind to others. Um, you see more a spiritual side than a religious side of things. Um, you know, and, and that's more just the mental side of things. We also have physical, I was blowing out light bulbs, <laughs> you know, uh, fried two different, microwaves within the first year just from touching them. Um, there were things, you know, I wiped an entire presentation right before we were going to go on at the MUFON Symposium. All the media disappeared just from me coming up too close um, to the, the computer. As soon as I walked away, all of them loaded back up. So um, there were several, you know, physiological encounters um, and things that happened afterwards as well. Uh, when I first found IONS, which is the International Association for Near Death Studies, um, I had signed up for the sharing groups with them. And I was, well, it was actually my husband that found them um, after I had told him. It took two years for me to tell him about the near death experience. And I was terrified. With him being a Southern Baptist minister, he was very much more rooted in the religious ideology than I was. And um, I mean, even being a pastor's wife, um, I had taken a step back over those last two years. And so I didn't know how he would respond. Uh, I knew that uh, as many as 80% of marriages fail after a near-death experience because people change so much. And he had seen those changes in me, but he, I think, was at the time kind of attributing it more to the physical um, you know, the, the after effects of the physical rather than the spiritual. He had no idea. Um, so once I told him, he said, you know, we're, we're going to figure this out together. And I mean, he's one of the good ones. He stuck by me and and he knew there was no lies in what I told him. Um, 
and and he knew my character. He knew me. Um, so he said, if you say this, then this is then this is what happened. You know, um, we'll figure out why it happened. And if we can, you know, understand where you were and why. Um, so anyways, the first thing he did was he signed up with IONS for the sharing groups. And we went on there and I just ugly cried for an hour. <laughs> I got to keep turning off my my camera and everything. It was hard for me because out of the group, there were maybe 30 of us in there, maybe four or five had had actual near-death experience. And everybody else had had wonderful encounters. And so me coming on for the first time and trying to share, I did not have a wonderful encounter. I was terrified. Um, I was scared. That first two years was hell on earth for me because I was terrified of going back to the void and being alone and trapped there. Um, but I was in such horrible physical pain. I didn't want to be here either, you know, and so... It was a real struggle those first couple of years. Um, but then trying to share that with a group that couldn't really relate, they were caring and understanding. They were very compassionate. But beyond that, I couldn't find that connection that I needed um, in understanding the darker, you know, distressing encounters. Uh, I ended up finding Nancy Evans Bush and she was the secretary for IONS for years and years. She, I believe she was the president, too, for a while. Um, and she really was the, the champion of the distressing near-death encounter. Um, she had had one herself during childbirth. And she was really the one that was saying, look, it's not all love and light. There are other types of encounters that people are having, and we've got to start paying attention to them. And so for years and years, she was a one woman crew trying to bring um, any kind of awareness to distressing encounters. She's actually the one that coined the term distressing near death experience. Um, and so I, I struggled with that aspect of it. I think one thing that people that have had even good near death encounters, um, you know, very radiant ones, they, I don't think that they they go through the same kind of trials sometimes, even upon returning, that the distressing uh, experiencers do. Because a lot of times we are met with blame. What did you do to deserve it? You know, um, what kind of person were you, were you? So our character is called into question. Um, that doesn't happen with radiant encounters. You know, oh, it's more wonderful. You know, great. You made it to the other side. You did great. Uh, with the distressing, there's more, you know, finger pointing. You deserved what you got. You know, what, what kind of horrible person are you? Um, and then just disbelief from the religious side, um, especially Christian. And I know I talked to you some about that before we came on. Um, you know, calling into question my faith or or my um, or my character. You know, was I really saved? Um, that that's hurtful, you know. Um, I was a hundred percent bought in. I was a hundred percent Christian. I had a hundred percent faith. Um, so it wasn't my own doing that I had a distressing encounter. Uh, it was nothing I deserved, uh, but it was something I definitely needed. Um, so with the distressing encounters, we we are met with ridicule. We were met with um, disbelief from family members, loved ones. Um, I had my own loved ones question me, you know. Um, it, it, it's painful because you're already dealing with the psychological aspect of why me? You know, why didn't I have a wonderful, radiant homecoming, you know, that I was so hopeful for? Um, and all you can can really do is say, I did it. And there's a reason for it. Um, and it's not necessarily a negative reason. Um, I recently found that IONS now has restarted distressing um, sharing groups. And I went to the first one last month. And it's um, it's led by Kathy McDaniel, which I believe was a, a guest of yours previously. Uh, she had a horrific experience where uh, she had a hellish experience. Uh, much more distressing probably even than mine. 
Um, and so she's really the perfect person to be leading that because I'll tell you, Jeff, it was the first time that I felt community in eight years where I heard these people going, no, it was horrible, <laughs> you know? And you hate to hear that coming from another human being, but it's wonderful to know I'm not alone. You know, um, other people have have conquered this and they're processing it. And maybe there's something I can share that can help them. And maybe there's something they can share that can help me. Because I think that it takes a very strong personality to be able to undergo a distressing encounter such as what those in that group have gone through and to be able to process it and to bring it out to a greater audience. Um, it requires great strength. And, um, you know, I appreciate you and uh, for allowing me to come on here and share kind of my little piece of the puzzle that I've been able to bring forward. After years of processing it and now understanding where you went do you think now you can reframe it as really not a bad place that you went to and and maybe your distress was just due to unknowingness of where you were and are you absolutely are you able to reframe it now as like some place that actually may be a, a nice place to go to well, Jeff, thank you so much for that question, because you really hit the nail on the head with that one. Um, that's where I've come back around to. Um, I will say time and time again, the void held no ill will towards me. My distress there was of my own doing. Um, and I wasn't distressed when I first got there. And I wasn't distressed when I left. I was distressed whenever I felt alone and felt almost a spectacle to the source, um, because I didn't understand. And without that understanding, it it bred that distress within me. Um, I can look at it from a very different point of view now. And I've I've almost wondered what would happen if I, you know, do have another incident and I end up back over in the void. Would I be able to approach it differently with understanding and acceptance? Um, which I'm very hopeful I would be able to. Um, it taught me so much and has led me in such incredible paths, um, knowing that really I have to love myself. I have to follow my path. If I don't love myself, I can I can never follow the path that's set out for me. Um, and so in finding that, I found great strength. Um, and it's strength that I never would have had if I wouldn't have been specifically put in that void situation. Um, so yeah, I can I can look back now with thankfulness, um, but still a little bit of apprehension because you know it, it's still without my, outside of my comfort zone. But um, but I I see the need and I see the knowledge in it. Well, what's still so fascinating to me is that everything changed in the void once you had the realization that you have a problem loving yourself. Once you had that realization, the being showed up. So right. that that's the key to everything. And, and that's what I find so fascinating is maybe somehow you uh, subconsciously or without realizing it thought you deserved to be alone. I don't know. I'm but just, I'm, I'm pulling straws together, but I just feel like that, you know, that, that realization is fascinating and it changed everything from you almost instantaneously. It, well, it it was what I needed to come back with. I think in failing to love myself, I could never fully love others. Um, you know, I thought that I, I was doing my best. I think that's what we all do. We do our best. But I think that I had to have that deep understanding. Um, if there's a connection between all of us, if I'm not loving myself fully, how can I fully love others? Um, how can I, you know, radiate with that understanding and that compassion if I'm not allowing it fully within myself? And so it had to start with me. It had to start with me. Um, so, you know, maybe my ignorance prior did land me there um, in the void because I needed that time out. I had to have that realization so that I can do what I'm doing now and that I can, you know, Try to spread the message of, of love and of peace. And it's so simple, but 
I, when I first came back, um, I had such a struggle with everything was loud. Everything was bright. Everything was injustice and pain. I mean, I, I saw it everywhere. I couldn't even watch football. And you know, I'm Oklahoma, you know, so, you know, we we completely rearranged our Thanksgiving to be able to have uh, bedlam football games, you know, around Thanksgiving. Prior to that, after I came back, I couldn't watch a football game. It was too violent. I couldn't watch these boys slamming themselves into each other. Um, the violence, um, and like I said, the injustice, the Black Lives Matter was going on, and it, it was overwhelming um, to come from a place of complete understanding um, and connection with that understanding over in the void and to return to uh, a world that was so loud and so out of touch with our true nature. It was hard um, to reintegrate. Um, but all I can do is try to bring a bit of that void experience back over here and hopefully others uh, won't have to go to such extremes to, to learn the same lessons that I did. Let me ask you this. Now that you do have love for yourself, what do you think it would be like if you went back to the void with that knowingness and loving yourself? Do you think your experience would be a lot different? You know, I, I would hope so. Um, not a lot different. I enjoyed it um, to some degree because I've always had that fascination with the cosmos and with the outer realms. Um, so I was literally there and basking in it. Um, like I said, I did have distress of my own doing, but it, it, it wasn't a, a bad place. And there was the source there. I would hope that if I went back there, that I would be able to absorb even more, you know, more of the message, more of understanding of where I was and of our true nature, our true reality um, that I could bring back. Um, it, it was a place of learning. Um, and I, I, you know, as a, a student of learning, <laughs> you know, I would I would just hope that I would be able to to draw in as much as I could from there um, and, and bring it back here, because I think that that's where our beginning and our end is. That's where it all comes from. Um, and so to exist there in the purest form there with our source. Um, it, it was a, a privileged experience. I'll put it that way. I've had other guests talk about that the void could be a launch pad to other realities since, like you said, it's kind of outside of the matrix. Do you right. find that to be true? Absolutely. Absolutely. I felt like I was outside of any kind of simulated environment. Um, and that's where the source of all of these environments is. Um, I feel like there's a connection with the source and it's possibly learning from all of us, our individual experiences, um, and we're bringing it back to it. Um, and then, you know, there's so many things for us to experience. Who knows with the reincarnation, if we could go to another reality. Um, and there's so many other entities out there. There's not just human souls. There's ET souls. There's angelic souls. There's all kinds of, of beings that populate that area. I came in contact with one. Um, so there's so much more to our existence than our limited little human knowledge that we have here. Um, you know, it, the source was the source of it all. Um, you know, just plainly put, I, it's hard to translate into human language, um, but I felt very much that I was right there, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, all of it, outside of all of it, um, and the creator of it all. Can you share with us one of the most shocking UFO investigations that you've performed? Absolutely. Um, actually, I'll share with you the Miracle Mountain Schoolyard Encounter, which is the one that was shown on Ancient Aliens during the um, MUFON Files episode. And this is a case that took place here in Oklahoma, in southeastern Oklahoma, during 1975. 
and it was a schoolyard encounter. Um, there was a little boarding school that was nestled out in kind of the rolling foothills out there in southeastern Oklahoma. It's real wooded and everything down there. Um, a family by the name of Buchanan had bought up about 6,000 acres. So it was a huge, huge plot of land out there and built up this little boarding school where um, they took on little sibling groups and whatnot. And the Buchanan family themselves, they had like, I think it was 11 kids of their own. So uh, most of the school was their own children. And then they had several little um, family groups that also lived there with them. And they ran a, a cattle ranch out there. The kids helped out on the ranch and then went to school throughout the day um, there at the, at the main house. So in 1975, there was a boy named Randy and his brother that lived there at the school. And he was 10 at the time. And um, I'm trying to think if his brother was a little bit older than him, maybe 12 or so, but they were outside playing in the sandbox that evening. And they started noticing a um, elongated shape kind of floating off in the distance. And it was silver, metallic. Um, and over the course of an hour or so, he said it very, very, very slowly started heading towards their area. And as it did, they could get more detail of it. So they started alerting the other kids that were outside playing, you know, hey, look at that, look at that. And um, he said it was a, a saucer-shaped craft and it had a ring of lights around the center portion that flashed sequentially. Um, and it came and hovered very low over them. Uh, it settled over them and then settled over a group of trees there right in the front yard they said they were within you know, 100 yards or so of this thing, and it was only about 60 feet up off the ground. So they had an amazing view of this, this huge craft. Uh, they had gone in uh, to get the adults. At the time, it was Mother Buchanan that was there, and then the school teacher, uh, who was only 18 years old. So she was almost a kid herself. Uh, but they came out to see what was going on, and they're standing up right under this thing, looking at it, and they said it was completely silent. Um, and the teacher described that it lifted, um, well, let me back up. There was the oldest boy was there. He was a, a teenager, 15, 16 years old. He ran inside. He was terrified, uh, grabbed a shotgun and climbed up on top of the schoolhouse and aimed it at the UFO. When he did that is whenever it started lifting up and, um, she said it flipped up on its side and then flew away. And the boy on the house watched as it landed in a clearing over by the sawmill that was still on their property. He said it was about a mile away. Uh, so the adults get the kids inside. They're all, you know, excited and everything at this huge craft that they just saw. Um, they're trying to get them ready for bed. They get them in and... Um, Teacher said some of the students were scared and were hiding under their beds. So she got them out from under there and, and gathered them there in the, the living room in front of the fireplace for the night. And the oldest boy stood guard with his, his shotgun. Um, some of the kids started saying that they were seeing faces and beings outside of the windows. And she said, well, what do they look like? And they said they keep changing. So they were kind of shape-shifting. Um, you know, so they couldn't get a very good look at, at what exactly they look like. So the older boy started boarding up the windows and doors um, and nailed them shut. They were terrified. Um, and sometime during the night, uh, the teacher described that the sounds of, of nature returned and she knew it was over. So the next morning they get up and they go out on a field trip. They pack sack lunches. All of the kids remember this. Um, and I interviewed um, five of the kids that were there. Uh, and half of them haven't kept in touch throughout all of these years. And they still were able to relay very similar information about the, the craft itself, the sequence of events. They all remember it 100% because it affected them so much. But one of the main things that they really remember was going out that next day with their sack lunches to go take a field trip to look for the UFO. So they go out there and they don't find anything. So they they return and 
On the way back, the teacher checked the outdoor uh, meat locker to see about getting out some food for, you know, making for dinner or whatever for lunch. And um, all of the meat, the processed beef, she said there was two sides of beef that was in that freezer was completely gone. So sometime during the night, during this encounter, all of this meat went missing. Um, but the next day, she said, the uh, Mr. Buchanan had returned home and she told him about the missing meat. Well, they went out there and all of the meat had been returned. And so Mr. Buchanan said, no, we're, we're not eating this meat. Um, don't know what, what's happened to it. If it, you know, mysteriously disappeared and now has reappeared. So he took it out into the field and burned it. Um, but I think it's interesting because they had cattle there on the ranch. So it wasn't like a cattle mutilation. Instead, in this instant, the processed beef was what went missing um, and then was later returned. So um, so that was the Miracle Mountain schoolyard encounter that uh, that I was privileged to be able to investigate here. And um, like I said, it was it was on ancient aliens and. Uh, I know that there's other things in the works talking with some of these kids because this this story goes so much deeper. Uh, the little town where it happened was Hartshorn, Oklahoma, and they have had, had sightings out there since the 60s. Uh, there was a woman here named Alta Claire Morgan that was taking um, reports back then, 60s and 70s, of the sightings that were happening all over that little small town of only 2,000 people. And there's hundreds of reports out of a town of 2,000. And it's still going on today to some degree. Um, but I know that there's you know some researchers that have taken some real deep interests that I've been working with um, in getting more information about what has been going on in that little small town. Um, and it, it it gets into some deep stuff. So I, I'm excited about some of the information that'll be coming out here shortly. Earlier, you mentioned that you have a book. What's the title and where can people find out more about it? Yes, my book is Dying to Meet Them, One Woman's Incredible Journey from NDE to UAP. And it's available on Amazon and in Barnes and Noble and any of your other local bookstores. All right. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? And if so, how do they contact you? Absolutely. They can contact me through my website. It's mindytotfest.com, M-I-N-D-Y-T-A-U-T-F-E-S-T.com. Uh, there's also a link to the book there. And there's even on the book page, there is a playlist of songs that really kind of inspired um, some of the book um, or it, it relates the emotional side of it that I felt very deeply so if people relate musically to emotion, that would be a, a wonderful thing for, to, for them to check out. Um, you can also reach me at mindy.mufonok at gmail.com if you want to just email me directly. So any of those ways, they should be able to get in contact with me. And I'm, I'm pretty responsive normally. All right. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Sure. I think that the the overarching message, which you probably hear time and time again, is be kind. Be kind to each other. We're all in it together. We're all connected. And, you know, we're all going to return to that source. Uh, love yourself, love others, and extend kindness anytime you can. Uh, it makes a difference. Mindy, thank you for your message. And thank you for being my guest. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. I look forward to talking with you soon. Me too. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.